Hello everyone, um, I'm Alice Meadows, uh, I'm uh, the Director of Community Engagement at NISO. NISO is um, the US, uh, the, the National Information Standards Organization based in the US um, and uh, is the newest partner in uh, organising Pidapalooza. So we're very delighted to be part of this event. Um, I have been involved since the beginning because I used to work at Orchid, so Pidapalooza is my favourite event of the whole year, <laughs> with the exception of NISO Plus, which is our own uh, own conference, which I have to mention or my boss will tell me off afterwards. Um, but anyway, welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to um, introduce our first uh, plenary speaker of the day, Adriano Romero Olivares from New Mexico State University. I am delighted for several reasons. First and foremost, I'm really, really happy that we are kicking off Pidapalooza with, by, by hearing from a researcher um, because I think, you know, at the end of the day, what we're all doing in the PID world is serving researchers. So making sure that we listen to what they have to say, understand their needs and do our best to meet those needs is really, really important. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is um, that I've heard Adriana speak before. Um, I actually, that our, we were prompted to invite her to speak here because I had heard her speak at the Society for Scholarly Publishing, an event in September where she was absolutely fantastic. So I know we're going to be in for a big treat. And the third and very personal reason is that um, Adriana works in the same field as my daughter, soil microbiology, and is one of my daughter's heroes. Um, so I am especially delighted um, at a personal level to be welcoming you, Adriana. So I will turn it over to you and thank you very much. Thank you so much. I am very happy to be here this morning. Um, let me share my screen. I was having a lot of fun uh, reading the, the chat box. I'm gonna be very honest, I am wearing my pajama pants because why not? Okay, so today I wanna talk about how PIDs have made my life easy and what could be improved. Um, as Alice mentioned, uh, my name is Adriana Romero Olivares and I am an assistant professor in New Mexico State University. I am a soil microbiologist, and in my lab, we study how soil microbes are responding and adapting to climate change, and how that consequently affects the cycling of carbon and the emission of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. So I, uh, I wanna first um, start by being very honest and saying that I didn't really know what persistent identifiers were, until I was invited to speak at Pirapalooza. So this is the re recreation of what happened. Um, I got Alice's email. We would like to invite you to be the speaker at Pirapalooza 2021. And then this was my face. So I very quickly Googled um, persistent identifiers and then I was like, oh, that's what they're called. And I accepted. I would love to. I'm a big fan of kids. So um, it was really interesting for me to discover what the actual name of a lot of this um, identifiers that, that I use. Um, you know, I just didn't know that that's what they were called. Anyways, I just want to um, say that I accepted the invitation because it turns out I love persistent identifiers. And again, when I say that I didn't know what PITs were, I mean, I just didn't know the official name of these super useful links and combination of numbers that I've been using my entire career. I did know what EOIs are because that's what I email people when I find a great paper that I want to share with them. And I also knew what um, ORCIDs were because I have one and um, I created my ORCID account a few years ago. And now um, they also ask for your ORCIDs uh, when you are either an author or co-author for a paper that um, you're submitting for publication. This is optional though. So again, I just, I, I really love kids. I just didn't know what they were called. So I wanted to know if I was alone on this. I was wondering if I was the only scientist that didn't really know what kids were. So obviously I asked on social media. So first I asked on Twitter and I, I asked, you know, broad question, do you know what persistent identifiers are? Do you use them? And I got approximately 87 votes and um, the results were interesting. 
So these were the options. Yes, 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 no, 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 yes. So most of the people said no, no. And I thought that was strange because my understanding was that most people who follow me on Twitter are other scientists, but perhaps I'm wrong. 25.3% voted for no, I don't know. And I, this was kind of a joke option I gave because that's the one that I was. Don't know what they are, but I do use them. Um, but I wasn't expecting anyone to click on that one. Um, but that was the second most popular option. And only 11% knew what they were and they used them. Um, so anyways, I was really puzzled by, um, by, these, uh, by these results. So then I decided to ask on Facebook, um, and a group that I'm part of called Científicas Mexicanas, so Mexican Women Scientists, for, uh, for those of you who don't um, know Spanish. So I asked the same question, but this time I gave a few examples of what it's are. And um, the, the main options were, were the same ones, a little bit different though. So yes, I use them, but I don't really think much about them. Yes, I use them and I love them. No, I don't use them. I don't know what they are. And so this community is more specific. All of the people in this community, we are scientists. Um, so obviously the, the response that was more popular was, yes, I use them, but I don't think uh, much about them. Um, you know, some people are just ungrateful, but at least um, I knew that most of the scientists in this community do know what they are, even though they don't really care much about them. I think this is unfortunate, and I will say more about that a bit later. So, you know, the face of ungratefulness. So when I think about how PITs have helped me in my career, I can't really remember what it was like without them. And that is probably because I started my science career in 2003, and DOIs were invented in 1997, and I started grad school in 2008, and orchids were announced in 2009. So PITs have been in my life, scientific life, I must say, since the beginning of my, of my science career. It's something that they, they've just been with me since the very, very beginning. And this um, got me thinking that there's other types of PITs that I use all the time. So when I think about persistent identifiers, I also think about the kids that nature offers us and that I've also used in my research my entire career. You see, I study fungi, uh, but I study them through DNA and other molecules that I extract from soil. So I can't really see the fungi, but I know who's there based on this natural pits. So these sequences are precise enough to know that Based on this combination of nucleotides, so these letters right here, you have these specific species. So thanks to this combination of DNA letters, you know that you have a unique species and it cannot be any other one. This is because no other species shares this combination of letters. It's unique to this species. So if you have these combination of letters, then you know for sure that you're talking about penicillin swakey, which is this mold right here. However, this system only works and it's specific enough when these sequences have been organized and annotated and when we can match these sequences to a specific fungus that we have seen and that it has been taxonomically identified. If we don't have this specific information, then these sequences are not very useful because this is what we get. So we get a lot of fungal species strain, fungal species strain, fungal species strain. So we know that these sequences belong to a fungus, but that's pretty much it. And knowing that it's not very useful because there's over 5 million fungal species. Also, none of these natural pits are that useful if there's no repository where to find them. So luckily for us, we have Denbank. 
this is a repository for DNA sequences, protein sequences, and um, other types of nucleotides. So we have this one space to deposit all natural kits, regardless of where they came from. It's really useful. It's very easy to use. And GenBank also has curators um, who make sure that submitted sequences are clean and annotated when possible. So with all of this, I'm trying to point out that this is somewhat of a problem in science where we have persistent identifiers, which are super useful and informative, but a lot of researchers simply don't use them and most journals don't enforce their use. So for example, in this paper with many authors, you can see that only like one third of them provided their ORCID. And I'm pretty sure that the rest of the authors probably don't have one and don't care to have one. So on social media, I asked people to elaborate on their answers. Why do you use them? Why you don't use them? Just to get a sense of, you know, more specifically, where was, you know, where were people standing? Why did they answer what they answered? So these are some of the replies that I got. I use ORCID because I have a generic name and it's a good system to associate to my name so people know which Jennifer Jones we're talking about. I use ORCID because I have two last names and there's inconsistencies in my publication record. Some publications have my first name and some others have my second last name. ORCID is a good way to link my work regardless of my last name. Um, and this is a very personal problem for me in Latin America, for example, um, all of us, people from Latin America, just in general, have two last names. And that is not because we married and didn't want to get rid of our, of our last name and added another one. No, this is because that's how our names are. We get two last names. The first one comes from your father and the second one comes from your mother. And they're not hyphenated. So there's a space in between. Actually, my last name is Romero space Olivares, not Romero hyphen Olivares. But when I was um, writing my very first manuscript for publication, my master's advisor, um, she told me I should pick one of my last names, to which I was shocked because they're both mine. I didn't want to pick one. So then when I told her I don't want to pick one last name, I want both. Then she told me this was um, in 2008. She told me then you should hyphenate your last names because if not, people are going to get confused. They are not going to know which one is your last name and probably they're just going to choose the last one. So it's going to create this complicated um, situation with your publication record with time. So I ended up hyphenating my um, last name, which is now Romero um, hyphen Olivares. And it's fine. It, you know, at, at least I can have both. Another thing that I found, another thing that people said is I use ORCIDs to identify authors. I'm not very familiar with names and last names from other countries. So I, um, so ORCIDs help me differentiate between last names and name. And it also helps me identify and track authors work. And another thing that I heard was I use DOIs to quickly search for papers. It's very useful to just click on something and get instantly redirected to the publication. I use ISBNs to make sure my students are getting the exact book, year and edition that we need for class. So a lot of things that I had never thought about that makes me appreciate it um, even more. So then there was the other um, group of people, the ones that don't really appreciate it. And I wanted to know um, why exactly that is. So one of the answers was, I personally don't like to use them. It's another way of technology keeping track of us. <laughs> and this one, I find a, a little bit funny because, you know, this was on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> so I promise you, DOIs aren't getting more info out of you than, than social media. Another one was, it's confusing and impersonal, especially DOIs. I want people to know who were the authors of the paper, not what the DOI is. Another one, I feel like there's too many. DOI, ORCID, and I get confused with this and how it relates to research aid, academia, publics, et cetera. I can't keep, keep track of them all. And I just don't find them useful. I am a scientist, but I'm not in academia, so I just don't care about them. 
So regardless of these personal opinions, I personally love PITS. I love Publons and how it keeps track of my publications based on my ORCID. I like to keep track of the manuscripts I have reviewed based on their DOIs. What I do find a little bit annoying though is what others mentioned about having too many. So for example, if Publons is using ORCID to track publication productivity, why won't they use it for other things as well? You know, like they came up with their own kit, which is this researcher ID badge. So this is something that I do find slightly annoying. And I do agree that there's there's just too many, and this is just one more way to overwhelm people with pits. I don't really know what goes on behind the scene behind the scenes, but you know, if four kids work, why come up with another ID that does the exact same thing that ORCID? So if we could come up with a system that would unify not only PITs, but also platforms, I think that would be a very useful advancement in our community. And I could also get rid of this very unsafe file that I have here, where I have the user and password for each one of the different journals and platforms that I review for and that I submit manuscripts to. Even within the same platform, sometimes you need an account for when you review versus an account for when you submit. And that's just ridiculous. So what I hope for this um, is the unification and use of a few bits across a wide set of platforms. I would also hope for a broader use of pits from the science community, like journals more actively encouraging people to have an orchid for submitting manuscripts. So I hope that I've convinced you that pits have been a part of my scientific career since the very beginning and that I appreciate them a lot. We learned that a lot of people in science use them, some don't. To really appreciate and take advantage of the power of ORCID's journals should encourage their use. Some people like them, some don't. Although I appreciate the concern regarding keeping track of, I don't really think this is a security issue that one should be putting too much thought on, but I can totally relate with the feeling of, of feeling overwhelmed with all of the different PEDs and platforms. As with nature pits, PITs are only useful when people use them. A lot of people, even scientists, don't know what PITs are. So educating people on what they are and their use could be very useful and would potentially increase and normalize their use even more. If there's not a unified repository and we don't know what they are and people are not using them, they are not really serving their purpose. Their, I'm sorry, they are not really serving their purpose to the broader scientific community. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Adriana. That was Adriana. That was really wonderful. And there's you. You hopefully didn't get distracted by it, but there was lots of amazing chat um, in the channel. So I am going to. We have one official question, mm -hmm. um, which I will ask you, uh, which is a great question. Um, do you think that researchers should know anything about persistent identifiers, or or should they just work in the background and researchers shouldn't have to care about them? And all, please do add um, other questions uh, in the question box or in the chat box. I mean, I think they should um, know about them and I think they should use them. Um, I almost want to say that journals should make the use of PITs, um, you know, what's the word, required. I know that would uh, rub the wrong way a lot of people, but, you know, it at least for me, it's the only way that I can think of that would make our life easy just in general. Yeah, and um, some journals actually do uh, make at least ORCID IDs required. Um, I think there were around 2,000 at the last count. And, oh. and in fact, there was very little pushback. I was working at ORCID at the time when that was introduced and, and there was actually very little pushback, interestingly. I think we were expecting much more, so. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. I, I mean, I wonder if it has to do maybe with, you know, generational differences. At least I know that most people my age are really excited about having their ORCID and sharing DOIs. Um, I'm not really sure how, you know, pe other people feel about it, but maybe it's a generational thing, which is good. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably right. Um, we have another question, which is how important are the sort of the brand names 
is it important to teach researchers, you know, what an ORCID is, what a DOI is, what data site is, cross-ref and so on? Or is that sort of, does that hinder more than it helps? Um, no, I think I think that would be very helpful. I actually, a couple of years ago, um, we were having a lab meeting. I was a postdoc at the time, and we were talking about problems because it was kind of like rest recently, you know, we were just learning about it. And I remember uh, my postdoc advisor was like, what is this for? So I just feel like when people don't know about these different platforms and these different kits, maybe they get kind of like overwhelmed, like I said. But then once we explain to her, like, this is what it is, and this is how you can keep track of everything, and they use ORCID, and they use um, DOI. So then she was like, oh, that's really interesting. How nice this one platform that unifies sort of like my productivity of publication versus reviewer. So I do feel that when you educate people on what each one of the different bits are and what they are used for, it, it's really it's really fruitful. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Thank you. Okay, we have lots of questions pouring in now. So we'll thank you for doing a very good job on finishing in a very timely way because it means we can get to hopefully most or all of these. The next one is, um, if your conferences had PIDs, how would that be of use to you? Oh, that's really interesting. So, well, I guess, um, I guess we, I, I'm not really sure. So something that we do often is like use hashtags. Like for example, I'm very active in the Ecological Society of America. Um, so whenever we have a conference, so we have the hashtag ESA 2021, but then sometimes I think there's like this other um, group that they also use ESA and it has nothing to do with the Ecological Society of America. So when we use, you know, when we're on social media, we could use that DOI instead for the conference rather than the hashtag, which is sometimes depending on the year, it can get really weird. Sometimes it's like e of eco 2020 or something because someone already took this hashtag before so it would be useful in that way like this is the conference that we're talking about and then i personally can think about um using that boi for the conference that i attended and i presented in my cv Great. And I'm going to take um, uh, uh, moderator's uh, advantage and say, uh, I know that in some disciplines, um, many disciplines, probably mo most, actually presenting at a conference is something that you um, would like to get more recognition for, but it's often hard to do so. So I imagine that having some kind of identifier for a conference that you could link, for example, to your ORCID record would be helpful because it would it would make that kind of connection, wouldn't it? That would be great. Yes, that would be great. Um, it would save me some time too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, next question. Um, do you think that, ooh, oops. Oh, sorry, one, I had a question right there and it just disappeared. Um, okay, never mind. Uh, what is your view on seamless integration of PIDs in researcher workflows? For example, um, you know, if, if, if somebody, well, this is possibly not something that we would want to happen um, with my old ORCID hat on, but your editor adds your ORCID for you um, as opposed to having it mandated um, for you. So so what would be better? Would, would it be better to, and they're not mutually exclusive, to require, for example, ORCID IDs or to have the process by which you add them yourself made easier? Um, I guess either one would be fine for me. Um, I I guess... I think about whatever can save me time is the best thing to do for me. So, you know, if adding the ORCID was something that the editorial was in charge of instead of me, that would be great. I just recently published a paper. I didn't have that many authors. It was only um, three co-authors and me, and I had to like manually search for the ORCID of each one of them. I have other publications where I have more um, co-authors, so searching for the ORCIDs of each one of them um, took a bit of time when you are the one submitting the, the manuscript. Yeah. So yeah. if it's something that the editorial could take um, care of, that, that would be really, really wonderful. And they could just like add, you know, like a checkbox. Can we yeah. add your ORCID um, when this is about to be published? And then you just say yes, and they can take care of it. I think that would be great. Great. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, there are loads of questions, so but we're bombarding you, but this is so, <laughs> so, so helpful. Thank you. Um, so another question is, would um, a pit, would persistence identifiers for grants be useful to you and, and sort of how would that help? Um, I mean, I think they would be useful as well. I'm not really, I think it would be like useful for NSF, for example, it would be a good way for them to also keep track of, you know, the, the program and, you know, if it has this combination of words, then it belongs to this program. And then if they could just add like this number that, um, tells you already which grant number you're talking about, I think it would be really helpful. It would also be be very helpful for me when I'm searching for people who have previously gotten um, certain grants. For example, I often see um, on people's CVs, for example, oh, NSF, uh, this um, this project award or something. And then you go to NSF website and it's really, it's really not the most user-friendly um, platform. So having a DOI for grants, I think it would be, it would be very helpful. And it would also, of course, mean that you could potentially carry it through if you were publishing an output from that grant um, and you could carry the grant ID through with you in the publications. That would make life that easier for you and the funder, I think, wouldn't it? It would be it would make it very easy to if there was just like this link, which would take you to the main like NSF page or whatever. And then you could yeah. see there what grant they're talking about. Right. Usually you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Add the project, um, the award number. And then it takes like multiple steps to actually find the the award. So having a DOI that you could link in your um, in your paper, which would at the same time be linked to your um, orchid, it would be yes, amazing. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I think we can't hear everybody, but I have this feeling that in hundreds of homes around the world, there are people standing up cheering at this point. So yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, uh, this is an interesting question. Do you think that knowledge of PIDs depends on the region? So ex for example, the, the example given was your experience with the poll, was this done mainly with um, Latin American Mexican people? And do you think there is more or less uh, knowledge and understanding depending on where you are in the world? Um. I would think probably yes. Um, the I would I would think yes. I'm not really sure. Um, it seems that in the scientific community, just in general, at least in like the Western world, it seems pretty mainstream. Um, I wouldn't. I couldn't speak for what other parts of the world, um, you know, think about uh, it's but at least for me in the scientific community in the Western world, it seems like they're, they're really mainstream. I, I do think that regardless of, you know, the US versus Latin America, I feel like there's a lot of people who don't really know what they are or what they're used for, um, even within the scientific community, especially like younger um, scientists, for example, um, or even, for example, there's a, a couple of, of, of master's students that I'm in contact with, and I was, I'm telling them about this. I don't have anyone in my lab yet, so I'm the only person in my lab. But I was talking to a couple of master's students that I'm working with, and I, I, I told them about this conference. And, you know, what's PITS? Like, they have no idea. And I was like, well, ORCIDs and DOIs. And they're like, what's an ORCID? And these <laughs> yeah. people are just, you know, they're just starting grad school they're starting their scientific career. I'm pretty sure they're going to learn eventually what they are, but it just seems like they don't. Yeah. Um, and it, I think it's something that should be caught when you are in college, It's especially if you're going towards a STEM degree. Yeah, yeah. And actually one of the other questions is whether you um, tell your own grad students to get, uh, get an orchid. So when you have one, hopefully you will. <laughs> Um, okay, here's a, an interesting question. Do you think researchers would value PIDs more if they realise their work is essentially digitally invisible and undiscoverable without them? Um, because, you know, PIDs work behind the scenes to make content and, and people discoverable. Uh, but because it's behind the scenes, you know, there often isn't a reason why for people to know about them. Um, so how could, how, well, I guess question one is, do you think that, that people would care more if they knew about them? And if yes, how can we get them to care more about, um, about the, the various services that publishers and, and others provide? Yes, I think they would, if they knew about them, they would definitely care more about them. Um, 
and again, I guess just educating people on what they are and what they're you know, what's their purpose. I'm not really sure how that could be done. Um, you know, I guess some of us like speaking up about how useful orchids and DOIs are would be a good way to start. And, um, you know, just like, I don't know, maybe like doing some advertising about, you know, when you get an orchid, this is, this is what you get when you, when you, so when you have pits, this is how they, this is how they serve you. I think it would be, um, I think it would change a lot of people's minds. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we actually have a bunch more questions, but we are at 25 past and we're going to try and keep things very much on track. Um, so if you have time to head over to the Slack channel and maybe continue the conversation there for a little while, that would be fantastic. But I just want to end this first session of Pitapalooza by saying a huge thank you. Um, you know, I really, this was this was the perfect start um, and I am just so grateful to you. And I will even put my camera on, which I don't really like to do so that I can say proper thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, thank it was you a so pleasure, much. Adriana, thank you. Yeah, this was super fun. Thank you so much. Imagine that repeated 394 times. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.